everyone and welcome. We're so glad you joined us as we hit the road for native plants at noon this month. I'm Sydney Ross, Outdoor Education Manager for Deep Roots. We have a great broadcast for you today with lots of exciting announcements. I'm happy you joined us to explore Poozy Conservation Area with MDC Forester Samantha Anderson and Natural History Biologist Dylan Freiberger. We're in for an exciting treat as we learn about the prairies and woodlands in Missouri. Before we begin, I'd like to make a couple announcements. First of all, we are incredibly grateful to you for your participation and support of our programs and webinars. We take pride in creating educational content for viewers like you. We also want to express a big thanks to the Missouri Department of Conservation for their partnership in this series and everything they do to help encourage and empower people to plant more natives. At the end of the month, you can hit the road and explore the areas we discussed on today's show. Join me for an all day adventure on Saturday, September 30th. We'll hike a few miles through Poozy Conservation Area, checking out the prairie and woodlands. I'm especially excited to take you to Panther's Den as seen in this image here, where we'll see sandstone bluffs covered in moss and liverworts. It's really cool. Space is limited and transportation provided. It's gonna be a blast and I look forward to seeing you there. If you enjoy our programs, be sure to register for the 2024 Planet Native Conference taking place February 15th and 16th here in Kansas City. After three virtual years, we're excited to be back in person at the Kauffman Foundation and Discovery Center. Enjoy presentations from experts like Guy Sternberg, the co-founder of Star Hill Forest Arboretum, which has developed the most comprehensive research collection of oaks in the US. At Planet Native, he'll discuss native trees in a changing climate, which is a relevant topic for today's episode of Native Plants at Noon on the Road. During the program, if you have questions, please note those in the Q&A tool on Zoom, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. I'll be using the chat to send you the plants mentioned or any link shared, including the link to the field trip to Poozy Conservation Area. Today, we're taking a trip to, oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Today, we're going to be taking a trip to Northwest Missouri, across the rolling prairies and through the woods of Chillicothe to take a closer look at Missouri flora. Last week, I had the pleasure of visiting MDC Forester Samantha Anderson and natural history biologist Dylan Freiberger. We spent a beautiful fall day hiking around the conservation area and discussing the beauty seen here. We also discussed the challenges involved with managing large land. And if you joined us for our recent field trips to Ernie Miller and Jerry Smith Prairie, you saw that each site is unique and requires different maintenance techniques. I'm excited to have the experts Sam and Dylan join us live for the Q&A after. All right, let's get started. I hope you enjoy this episode of Native Plants at Noon on the road to Poozy Conservation Area. Hey everyone, Sydney here from Deep Roots. I'm super excited to bring you all out here to Poozy Conservation Area in Chillicothe, Missouri for our Native Plants at Noon on the road episode. With me, I have Samantha Anderson and Dylan Freiberger. Did I get that right, Dylan? Yes. Awesome. Two amazing MDC employees that are here to bring us on a journey through Pussy Conservation Area. Today, we'll be looking at the forest and prairies here at Pussy Conservation, as well as a special place called Panther's Den. So go ahead and join us for this awesome on the road series and be sure to put your questions in the Q&A. All right, Samantha, thank you so much for coming out here to join us at Pussy Conservation Area. Um, so we're here to talk about trees. So give us a little insight as to what is um, found here in the forest at Pussy. Sure. Um, here at Pussy, we've got a little bit of everything going on. A lot of our um, forests and woodlands, we've got some drier sites that on um, south facing slopes that would kind of be more of a woodland type of uh, ecosystem and then we've also got some forests that are a little bit um, usually on our north facing slopes are a little bit wetter they're a little bit more dense mm -hmm. um, and then we do have a little bit of bottomland for just a teensy bit in down in our um, stream bottoms and things like that. 
Awesome. Yeah, a bit of everything. Um, right now we're in um, one of Poozie's woodlands. This is kind of a work in progress. Um, it's a lot of, we've got a lot of white oak in here. There's a lot of post oak. Um, yeah. Not much else, <laughs> currently. <laughs> um, sometimes we might see some shagbark hickory in here. There's a little bit of black oak in here as well. And, Perfect. Um, so since this is on a south facing slope, that means that our soils are gonna be a little bit drier. Um, and a lot of times oaks are really good at competing on drier soils. Um, they tend to put a lot of effort into, in the early stages of their development, they put a lot of energy into their roots so that um, it means that they're growing slower on top, but they're putting a ton of effort into their roots. So some of these trees, mm -hmm. they might have root systems that are maybe 10 years older than the actual tree wow. that we see up here. Um, That's and so cool. They'll just keep putting energy into that. And even if the top dies like this little guy right here, I bet you that root system is just huge. Huge. This, is, this top might have died back from maybe a fire, maybe a deer ate it or something. And it's finally kind of getting to the point where it might succeed if this other tree wasn't next to it. But um, Very cool. So I thought we might talk about a couple of the trees that you might see if you're in a woodland, what might indicate that you are in one. Um, and one of the first ones you might see, especially up here around Poozy and kind of northwest Missouri, is uh, post oak. And um, post oak has, if your tree's got leaves on it, um, you want to hold this? Perfect, now let's take a look here. <laughs> yeah, if your tree's got leaves on it, you're going to see these like cross-shaped leaves. It's going to have this really wide one on top, and it's going to have two that stick out almost like a cross, like a kind of mm -hmm. 90 degree angle there, and then it'll have smaller ones down here. The backs of the leaves are usually pretty fuzzy. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that is really fuzzy. So soft. And usually the bark is pretty rough, um, mm -hmm. kind of dark, and it'd be, um, if you had a white oak to compare it to, which we have back here. Oh okay, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you I just can see, see how much lighter the white oak is compared to a post oak. I do see that. That's awesome. I was going to ask, like, so <laughs> there's so many oaks here, and yeah, how do you tell the difference? So, uh, obviously, working with leaves is a great way to ID mm -hmm. trees, but also the bark. So, mm -hmm. um, and with this tree here, tell me how you were able to identify this. Sure. So, this one, we've got a white oak, and this is, um, there's kind of two different groups of oaks. So, we've got our white oak group, and we've got a red oak group. So, post oak and white oak are both in the white oak group. Um, and generally, I like to start with the white oaks usually have lighter, like more whitish gray type bark, mm -hmm. and where the red oak groups usually have more of kind of a grayish to black okay. looking base to their bark color. Um, and white oak leaves are, um, they've got a lot more lobes, yeah. and they're usually a little bit more delicate than a post oak almost, um, and they'll be really variable. You can kind of see on this tree, it's got some smaller ones here. And some trees don't have really big leaves. Yeah. It just, it really depends. Yes, I love it. It's like, um, I, I like to gamify native plants and things like that. So for me, this is like an advanced level, but so exciting to come into in the fall. And even if you want to go an extra level, uh, step up your game, wintertime tree ID, right? <laughs> and one of the best indicators for a white oak is actually um, the bark up towards the top. I don't know if you'll be able to see it as well on this one. We'll see. But it tends to get really platy. And oh. tends to be kind of big chunks that peel kind of from the side. I do see edges. that. I do see that. I don't know if that will be captured on mm -hmm. camera, but if I kind of compare it to this tree next to it, you might be able to see. Wow, very cool. But a lot of times, some of the, the best ways to ID a tree, especially when you start getting into really big mature trees, their bark is going to get kind of crazy down at the bottom. But if you look up at the branches, you're going to see that kind of younger tree mm -hmm. look and you'll be able to get a better idea of what tree you're looking at. That's awesome. Well, what other kind of trees do we have in here? You meant, uh, it's an oak hickory mm -hmm. mixed forest, right? So we do have, um, we do have a, a black oak here. So now you can kind of see the difference oh. between a white oak and this is a black oak, which mm -hmm. is in the red oak family. Nice. So it has leaves that look more like this. And they actually have these spines. All the red oak family oak leaves have little bitty spines right on the edges of their leaves. Oh, I and see that's that. How, and white oaks don't have those on their leaves. So at the bare minimum, you should be able to get um, Down a red there. oak group from a white <laughs> oak group just because of these little spines on the leaves. Um, Very cool. And so a black oak, it can be kind of confused with a red oak, a northern red oak. Um, 
a lot of times, but in this kind of a area and it's a little bit drier, usually we'll see black oak way more often than we'll see northern red oak. And um, one of my coworkers likes to describe this as um, like cooked hamburger meat at the bottom <laughs> is how it looks. Yes. Um, that's hilarious. But you can kind of see how this has got kind of black to dark. Yeah, it does. Yeah. A lighter, lighter that grayish white. Might be hard to capture on camera, but if you all join us for the field trip at the end of the month, September 30th, you'll be able to see in person these differences, and we'll talk more about that there in person. Very cool. So in these in the woodlands here on Poozy, we tend to try to manage these with prescribed fire. And um, this one's got one planned in the next year. Nice. Um, we'll be using one. Um, and um, the most important thing with a lot of the woodlands around here is historically there was over 27 million acres of woodlands between Texas and Minnesota, including Missouri. And now we're down to only about like 500,000 acres is what mm. it's estimated. So, wow. Um, so it's definitely worth um, putting the energy in to get these really neat ecosystems back up and running. Absolutely. And and remind me, how many acres is Poozie? It's a, a little over, was it 5,000? Poozie's just shy of 6,000 acres. Oh my gosh, that's right. That is so <laughs> many acres. <laughs> There's so much to explore here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As we were walking through um, the woodlands here, we even found um, some oak galls. And if you've all met me, you know how much I love insect architecture and making ink from it and things like that. But these are just some of the treasures you can find out here at Poozie Lake. And by the end of the month, we're going to see a lot of the fall color starting to come in um, and set in. So that it's going to be just a really cool area to check out. And it looks like we also have, while we're here in the woods, um, we've got a couple perennial, spe uh, herbaceous perennial species that um, I'd like to point out. Um, and I'm going to pull Dylan into this because he's our expert here, our natural history biologist. So, okay, golden rods. Tell me about this, Dylan. Which one do you think this is? So this is elm leaf goldenrod, um, mm -hmm. Solidago omifolia. It's a scientific name. It's fairly common on dry woodlands, um, kind of a dry woodland savanna species. Mm -hmm. um, blooms, you know, late August, September, like most golden rods. And has these beautiful yellow flowers that you can see. Yeah, and that is such an important uh, resource for our wildlife, especially as we go into uh, the cooler months and get ready for winter. Um, it's it's awesome to see goldenrods not only out in the prairies but also in in the woodlands and on the edges here. Very nice. So now we have left the woodlands and we are walking towards a more um, dry mesic prairie or average moisture prairie over here. And we've got some really cool surprises. I was so excited when we first walked up to see these friends. Okay, Dylan, so tell us what we're looking at here. So this is a uh, rough leaved uh, blazing star um, scientific name Liatris aspera. Um, a lot of us commonly see prairie blazing star out on our prairies and this species would grow on prairies as well but rough blazing star also can grow in dry woodlands and glades mm -hmm. in Missouri and in this situation it's growing in a kind of disturbed um, dry what was likely once woodland or mm -hmm. kind of savanna woodland matrix <clears throat> yeah, you can see the edge of the woods are just right there, right? So take a look at that. And I, um, I'm always curious to see how far um, some of these, you know, savanna type species will actually creep into the woods. And when I see what I see here is not that much. So they do prefer that sunnier area, but it is, they're covered in tons of pollinators too. So I see some, I think I see a hair streak. It's going so fast I can hardly see it. Here we go. Let's see if I can get a clear shot on that. Maybe not, but you see the butterfly there. There we go. Very cool. And then I saw some other butterflies on it, on the other ones there too. So a great source of uh, nectar for our migrating pollinators, but also the ones who, that you see more commonly at the end of summer. And then, let's see here. We saw 
some pussy toes here too. Let's talk a little bit about that if we can find a good little patch. Okay, so we've got a few things going on here, including some blackberry right there, but here we go. Okay, Dylan, tell us about this friend. So this is common name pussy toes, or um, some people call them cat's foot. Um, scientific name for this species is uh, Antonaria uh, parlinii. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a woodland indicator. You find this small, short little plant that only has basal leaves growing um, kind of just in any open area where it can get enough sun mm -hmm. in these dry woodlands and all throughout Missouri and dry woodlands. Uh, flowers in the spring, mm -hmm. and the flowering stalk will emerge from these basal leaves to be about six to ten inches tall. Um, and then spends the rest of the year uh, collecting nutrients to put on flowers for the next season. Very cool. And I, I understand it's the host plant for the American Painted Lady Butterfly. And um, I also understand it's lightly, I say lightly allelopathic. Um, I don't know if you um, or know, much, know about that or can speak on that, but um, that's something kind of interesting we learned recently um, at the Discovery Center because it... Um, we had some passion flower growing out from ours and it seemed to inhibit the growth. Um, and I'm not sure if that is specific to neglecta or um, certain pussy toes, but it would make sense that they would be because they have to kind of keep other plants at bay. Yeah, that's a strategy for a lot of shorter plants. Um, you know, the way that they can create space for themselves to get sunlight is to um, prohibit or inhibit other species of plants from growing tall enough to to shade them out. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. And then what do we? We've got some yellow cuties here too. Remind us what these are. So this is uh, a species uh, genus Bidens. Mm -hmm. um, they get those little needles, right? Yeah, um, Spanish needles or um, stick seed. Mm -hmm. um, this is an annual plant, very weedy. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find it growing along roadsides, flowering in the fall. It can grow in wet areas or dry areas. Cool. Just one of those that we see out here. So I'm always curious what, what it is we're looking at, right? Well, awesome. These are two exciting species. Then we're going to hop over to the other side of the prairie and take a look at some of our other plant friends there. Okay, we're back with Dylan. And we want to take a look at a couple species that we found here at this other side of the prairie. So tell us what we got here. We've got a dried seed head. Yes, this is already flowered, but we still have seed heads here. This is in the mint family, and it's slender mountain mint. Nice. It has very narrow leaves. Um, and if you pick the leaves and crush them up and smell them, very minty. These ones aren't super minty right now because it's been so dry. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, typically they are very, very minty. This is a common prairie species. It's excellent for pollinators. Um, I love the texture too of the seed heads. Like, I think that's just so beautiful. And when the, the rest of the prairie starts to get their fall color set in, this will really stand out too. Yes. And Slender Mountain Mint, yeah, it's great for pollinators. I see tons of um, wasp species on them when they're in bloom. And it is just the coolest show. There, we, we saw, I wish we had gotten it on film, but we saw a really cool wasp earlier. Um, and I can just imagine this area here was just covered in wasps and different kinds of pollinators. Certainly. Yeah. And another prairie species we have on this small prairie is tall Coreopsis. Oh, so let's take a look at that. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. It's a fitting name for this species of Coreopsis. I'm like, most of the other species we have on Missouri prairies, this one can get, you know, upwards of four or five feet tall. Is that right? Most yes. of the other ones are, are much shorter. Um, but nice. it's identified by its <clears throat> trifoliate leaves. Mm -hmm. um, and it has kind of a glaucous or waxy coating on the stem. It kind of rubs oh, off yeah, I when see you touch that. it. Interesting. Oh yeah, it did. That's really cool. Yeah, it's dotted. This whole area here is just dotted with those. I see that. I see um, some different goldenrods here too. Uh, and remind me, what kind of goldenrods are these again? So, Canada, or yeah, this is either Canadensis or Altissima. 
So tall goldenrod or Canada goldenrod, mm -hmm. very common species yeah. um, in Missouri. But we also have uh, old field goldenrod, Solidago nemoralis. Let's take um, a look at that. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you're good. That's great. <clears throat> This, so, is, this yeah. is commonly found on prairies, um, and namesake, old field goldenrod, it, it can grow in old fields as well. It's fairly resistant to disturbance. Unlike the, the Canada goldenrod, this has what's called a basal rosette, which means that the largest leaves emerge from the base of the plant, and they gradually get smaller the further you go up the stem. Interesting. Yeah, they did. Look at that. Very cool. I didn't know that. That's a great way to identify it versus the Canada goldenrod, right? Yep. The, on this, or autism, whichever. This, this goldenrod, the, the largest leaves will be towards the middle of the stem and get smaller towards the top and smaller towards the base. Oh, so that is such a helpful way to identify goldenrod. If you start keying out goldenrods, that will be one of the questions. <laughs> okay, <that> cool. <laughs> Keep an eye on that for the, the goldenrod test, right? Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. Okay, we're gonna make our way back and head over to our next stop, which is Panther's Den. Okay, so we're checking all this out. <laughs> Holy crap, what? Okay, Dylan, you were, you were talking about this. Tell us what's going on here. I see someone peeking out here from the prairie. Yeah, so we noticed this driving along. This is a uh, cream gentian, uh, gentiana alba. Oh, it's so cool. Okay, I gotta get out of the car. Park it. We're gonna go check this out. <laughs> Talk about roadside botany. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. This is so exciting. Let me get my camera steady. Okay. So, wow, look at that. Yeah, so this is one of three gentian species we have and up here in north missouri um surprised to see this one here um i don't think i've ever seen this one before yeah these flowers are not quite open yet mm -hmm. um, but they'll open a little bit and it'll be a, a great plant for, for late bees um, to get nectar from so i wonder do you think because of the pale color you think they're potentially moth pollinated or is it kind of like other gentians where it you need a really strong body to push in there to get the the resources. What do you think? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I know um, the other species of gentian, uh, like the bottle gentian, uh, are bumblebee pollinated. Mm -hmm. They'll actually go into the tubes and then emerge later. Uh, but cool. this species um, actually opens its flowers a little bit more than the bottle gentian. Interesting. Um, That's very cool. Well, we'll have to do. I'll have to look into that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely look that up. Wow, that is awesome. Thanks for stopping the car so we could check this out. <laughs> yes, awesome. Okay, now we're on to Panther's Den for real this time. What do you think, Dylan? I think it's her toe. I mean, what is the other one? Um, is like a trilobo? There's it's not that. No. It's not Missouriensis. So this is one of our Rudbeckias that is growing here on the edge, and you can kind of see. Ooh, listen, I don't know if you can all hear the leaves falling, but it's really beautiful. So all that yellow there on the edge, that's all Rudbeckia. And we have Rudbeckia herda on the Sweet 16, most likely to succeed need a plant list, but we're wondering what this little cutie is. So I will hopefully, um, while you all are watching this, have I did this <laughs> before we get to airing this? Um, but yeah, one of the Rudbeckias, and they just, they're really awesome. Um, so, uh, again, another pollination source and nectar source for our insects. And they're pretty darn cute. And difficult to ID. They can be all these, th all these things can be true, right? <laughs> so I know some of the ways you can ID to. Um, some things that will be helpful is looking at the venate, venation, it's a tough word to say, the, uh, whether or not it has hairs on the leaves or stems, um, the different shapes there too as they meet. So stay tuned. Hopefully I'm putting right now in the chat what this plant is. 
this just in. We might have ID'd this as Triloba. Darn it, that happened to me last last night of plants at noon. <laughs> Rude Becky is man, right? Am I right? Right. <laughs> Okay, now we are walking up to Panther's Den. This is such an exciting area. And we'll see how it compares to the other areas we've seen here at Poozy. Oh, I think I just saw a gull. So a lot of folks will come through here for the uh, fall auto tour that's happening in October. So we'll include that in our resources. Gosh, just look at this. Oh my gosh. So beautiful. That's a snake root. That's the white flowers you're seeing here. And now take this in. You guys, this is freaking awesome. I think this is the quietest our viewers have ever heard me walking up to a place. But there's just so much to see here. Oh my god. Okay. So we don't often get to talk about ferns. And there's so much to talk about here. So I'm just going to let y'all dive in and uh, tell our audience what we're looking at here. Yeah. I'd like to start um, with kind of the natural community setting. This is Panther's Den at Poozy Conservation Area. Um, and this is one of the recognized natural communities on the area. This is a moist sandstone cliff community. Uh, it's characterized by um, sandstone outcrops on steep north-facing slopes um, that stay really, really moist throughout the year because they're north-facing, which means they're shaded during the hottest parts of the day. And they support a lot of cool plants. Uh, one of those is northern maidenhair fern. Um, so scientific part. name, Adiantum pedatum. Uh, northern maidenhair fern is characterized by these um, large, um, twice compound leaves. And let's see if we can see. Yeah, so um, most of the ferns we wow. well, the ferns we have they're not flowering plants and they don't produce seed. Um, instead, they reproduce uh, by spores. Yeah, that's the spores on the tips there. So these are actually sori. Okay. which are capsules that hold all the spores. So you can find these on ferns in the summer. Wow. And by fall, these will shed and the spores, if they land in a, a moist area that's suitable, will turn into a gametophyte and then grow into a fern like this. Like Gosh. you're seeing now. That's cool, yeah, I see there's like a nice clump of them here, kind of coming out on this edge here too. Yep, it's a common Missouri fern, it prefers uh, rich ravines, north-facing slopes. In this case, it's growing along this very moist um, base of this bluff here. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so why is it called Panther's Den? <laughs> um, so the history of the area is when kind of the earlier early settlers kind of came here. They found this spot and they just decided it was really special. They didn't really know why, but um, they've used it for weddings, they've used it for funerals, um, they used it for courting, 
Um, so kind of special wow. events happened here, but there is a legend that says that there was a panther and it had stolen a little girl um, and they had tracked it back to here. There's, um, there's a small little hole in the rock over there. Oh um, yeah. It used to be bigger, <laughs> but it's fallen in. And Let's go take a look then. at that. But that's where it got the name Panther's Den. I see. <laughs> so up in here is where the panther lives. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, so sandstone, can you talk a little bit more about why that is so unique here? Because um, I know Missouri is home to a lot of limestone, is that correct? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> throughout Missouri, we've got both limestone and sandstone. Most of the bluffs we see in the Ozarks are either limestone or dolomite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the eastern Ozarks, there's quite a bit of sandstone. Um, we don't have many bluffs in North Missouri, so any chance we get to see, especially a sandstone bluff, right? It's very neat. And so sandstone is typically softer. Um, yeah, it's almost like powder. You can see people have um, unfortunately drawn or like carved into the rock, even as old as 1956. But it's 2023. We know better, right? <laughs> yeah, some of this may be considered historic at this point. Very cool. <laughs> but yeah, the sandstone, sandstone is definitely weathered. Um, like all bluffs, it's kind of crumbling down. But these boulders wow. provide habitat for mosses and liverworts. And another fern I'd like to talk about. Let's do it. It's called walking fern. Oh, that's so cool. So unlike the maidenhair fern, this has simple leaves that are elongate. And the reason they call it walking fern, or the, um, the, the reason it gets that name is because these elongated leaves will actually lay onto the ground or on in this case onto the rock they'll take root and then grow a new fern so you what? can see that right here oh, so tiny so this is a this is a new individual very cool and that's um, how they spread so yeah you it, can see it up here on this edge and it's yeah working its way all over so this it's rock form of the, the way that this i guess gives the impression that it's walking across a rocket. They also produce <laughs> spores. Here's the, see that. the sori on this species. Um, cool. But they prefer to grow on rocks. Um, in this case, it's a boulder in this nice shaded. Um, yeah, look at hillside. that. I'd live here. It's nice. And then what do we have here? Is this a, is this another, a third fern? Yeah, this is, Oops. um, Likely woodsy obtusa. I'm not really sure. I don't know anything about ferns, to be honest. Um, ferns are something I, I strive to learn more about. <laughs> but it's very cool. This is definitely one that I see more commonly in Missouri. But try to get an idea on that. Nice. Gosh, this is so beautiful. And it's it's nice and cool down here, too. So we're here, um, the, what is it, the second week of September and it feels great. Um, I know it's been a little dry down I mean, well, in a lot of parts of Missouri lately. Um, but gosh, you can just feel the temperature change when you get over here. And again, that's in part because this is the, the aspect of this side. Um, it creates a cooler condition, right? It does. So it's like a little microclimate in, in a way. Correct. Yeah, and it supports um, some cool flowering plants as well. Yeah, let's take a look. This is a, a neat, neat flowering plant. It produces these wild-looking fruits. This okay. is white baneberry. I've never, I haven't seen this in the wild either. That's very cool. Yeah, it's got um, like a maidenhair fern. It's got large, twice compound leaves. Um, it produces a fruiting stalk in the summer um, that has white flowers and also white fruits. Um, but as the fruits develop. Um, the pedicels and the peduncle, which is essentially the branches of this, um, what's called a raceme, which is the flowering structure here, um, they turn red. And so you get this stark contrast of red and white. It really gives the, the forest floor a lot of color where this is common. Yes. Um, like the ferns, it prefers moist, north facing slopes. Um, it's actually um, been used medicinally to treat pain. Really? But generally, it's considered toxic, and mm -hmm. if you handle it, you, there's been cases of folks getting blisters or skin irritation just mm. by touching it. So I wouldn't recommend using it. So look, no touchy. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Gosh, this is awesome. And then we saw 
Oh, it's on that tree over there. We're gonna go look at this. We found a mushroom too. <laughs> Wait, there's another, was there another plant over here? I'm like a squirrel. There's so much to see over in this area. Okay, perfect. I already um, briefly mentioned white snake root, uh, just because that's a common plant that shows up this time of year. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I know it's weedier, uh, or at least some people consider it that, but um, moths love to pollinate it, other nocturnal pollinators, and it's just, it's another food source here in the woods, so. Okay, let's go look at that mushroom real quick. Yeah, this is awesome. So if you all want to come explore this area, you can join me in person September 30th, and we will explore and see what is going on out here at Poozy. And okay, here we go. Go look at this. Oh, it's got a little moisture in that one. Ooh, that might just be from the mushroom though. Whoa. Cool. Dryad saddle, I believe. It is. Very cool. Yep. Thanks for the idea on that. That's awesome. Yeah, it is edible and um, an easy way to ID it other than, you know, just the way it looks is if you take a piece of it and smell it, it smells kind of like watermelon rind. Oh yeah, I've heard that. Like watermelon rind or cucumber maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Very cool. Well, join us here at Poozy Conservation Area. Uh, whether you join us for our in-person field trip or you come visit for the auto tour in October, this is such an awesome natural area here in Missouri worth checking out. Thanks, everyone. That was so awesome, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so I just want to say thank you for tuning in to our broadcast of Poozy Conservation Area. And I'm so pleased to say that we have our friends Sam Anderson and Dylan Freiberger who are available for our Q&A today. So I'm going to go ahead and have them join us and we'll answer some questions about the conservation area. So please, if you have uh, anything you want to ask, pop it into the Q&A. We'll be talking all about prairies and woodlands and the different things you can see at Poozy Conservation Area. Hey, Sam. Hey, Dylan. How's it going? Hey, good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. Okay. So we have a couple questions here. I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, so our first question is, um, this might be for you, Sam. What is the difference between a white oak and a swamp white oak? Um, okay. So um, I think the thing that I would start with first on the difference between white oak and swamp white oak is where they're going to grow. Um, white oaks usually tend to grow in a little bit drier sites, maybe higher up on a slope. Um, swamp white oaks, you'll find kind of like the name implies, they'll be down in kind of wetter areas, closer to streams. They might be kind of hanging out with like hackberries or walnuts um, or kind of anything you'd see down in a lower, wetter area. Um, kind of swamp white oaks are kind of neat. Um, they've got a couple of their I showed you guys um, the white oak leaves. Their leaves kind of look like a white oak leaf, like almost like you took all of the lobes out of it and they're just kind of wavy around the edges. And the back side of those leaves are like almost bright white. They're really, um, the scientific name is Quergus bicolor. So mm -hmm. it's almost like the two different, um, and that's because of the, I think because of the leaves and they're very white on the back side. So if you see them laying on the ground, it, even when they're brown, um, you can still see that really stark difference in the color. And then the, also, if you compare acorns, um, swamp white oak acorns actually have, they grow off of a long stalk. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's one of the easiest things to see. If you see those long stalks with the acorn caps still sitting on the ground, you're like, oh, there's a swamp white oak around here. Where right, most white oaks are, have really short stalks that'll come off their acorn cap or almost none. So that's really helpful. I, I am a master naturalist, but I think every year, especially this time of year, I try to relearn my trees and figure out those visual cues. And that that little stalk you're talking about coming off the top of the cap, that is a great way to ID a swamp white oak. Um, and then I have a follow-up question. So um, tell can you I, can you talk a little bit about oaks hybridizing? And is that like something we see commonly? Um, because sometimes I look at a tree and I'm like, I can't tell quite if it's like a burr oak because <laughs> uh over at burr oak woods I've seen up front they have this hybrid tree that um, I believe David Doyle was talking about when we did our tour um I don't know if you can speak upon that just hybridization in general or cross-pollination 
Yeah, I mean, there. I don't. I don't have a lot of technical um, knowledge on it, but I do know that they will do that, and it is kind of common, especially if you've got a lot of um, a lot of different species hanging out together in the same forest. But um, um, a lot of times when I'm out identifying trees, I kind of still try to jam them into one box or another. <laughs> um, whether it's completely accurate or not, I don't know. Um, a lot of times, a lot of white oaks, they also, whether they've hybridized or not, kind of serve a lot of the same purposes, um, at least for, you know, deer and turkey and wildlife like that. I, okay, that leads into my next question. So what animals in Missouri rely on uh, acorns uh, from the oak trees? So um, a lot of um, a lot of our kind of game species like, you know, deer and turkey, and they tend to prefer white oaks to red oaks. Um, red oaks have a lot of a lot more tannins in them. I think they don't don't taste quite as good, but they'll still eat them. Um, ducks will eat. I think that the, um, they'll eat like pin oak acorns. So we try to keep some pin oaks in the bottoms where we're going to flood for de uh, for ducks or anything like that. And then, you know, squirrels and pretty much anything that can kind of get there hands on it they'll try to eat them I love that um and just as an aside I um I talked about ink making with galls but you can make some really cool um like silvery purple ink with acorn caps and like rusty screws so email me if you have any questions about that but it's really a fun way to also when you're out in the woods collecting to ID um that might be another way to use acorns as well but I digress. So, okay. I do have a question for you, Dylan, about baneberry. Um, so someone asked, does baneberry bloom or stay as like a little white berry? They said pod, but I think maybe they're referring to the berry structure. Uh, can you speak on what that looks like when it's in flower? Yeah. Um, so the, when we saw it, uh, what's shown in the video, it's pretty far along. It's already fruited. It's turned into a berry, but that starts out as just a little white flower. Um, similar in size to the the white berries that we saw. Um, I've never actually seen it in flower. Every time I catch it, maybe because it's so colorful when it fruits with the red stalks and the white berries, I always see it in in the berry form. So, um, but you can look up photos of the flowers. They're just little white flowers in that raceme shape, just like what we saw with the the berries. Um, and Dylan, I want to ask you about ferns because I feel as though um, just maybe this is because I typically host the show and I don't know a lot about ferns, um, but I'm curious what, how many types of different ferns can be found um, in like either Northwest Missouri or Missouri as a whole? And could you just talk about why ferns are different from like other herbaceous perennials, just kind of a basic fern conversation? Sure. Yeah. I couldn't tell you exactly how many ferns we have. Um, dozens. Um, there are, we do have some publications out, um, basically, you know, a guide to, or an identif identification guide to all the Missouri ferns. Um, you can use the Florida Missouri for that as well. Uh, I think it's volume one. You know, um, I'm going to pop that in the q and I have a link right here. Yeah, there we go. Um, they can be somewhat difficult to tell apart. Um, a lot of, even between uh, genera, um, you know, they all have those uh, twice compound or maybe just once compound leaves that, you know, from a distance or um, to the untrained eye all look very similar. Um, but but ferns are separated um, evolutionarily. Um, they're, they're much older. Uh, uh, they come from a, a completely different class than most of the flowering or than all of the flowering plants we have. So, you know, our flowering plants produce flowers and seeds. Um, Ferns are much simpler. They they produce spores, um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say. That's about fine. That. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's more than I know. So, and that actually kind of leads in. Uh, so, I, I don't know if you can go into a little more detail about the difference between spores and seeds, but you already uh, just said that it sounds like seeds are a little more complicated to produce compared to spores. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, much, much more advanced um, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, flowering plants are. Very cool. Awesome. Okay, well, I think, um, let me just double check to make sure we don't have any other questions waiting. 
All right. Um, I have one question. So I just want, um, Sam, if you could tell us a little bit about the upcoming auto tour at Poozy, because it sounds like so much fun. I, I hear about it every year, but I haven't made it up there yet. So give us a little sneak peek of what to expect. Sure. So um, this is actually the 37th year that we've had that we'll be having the Poozy Fall Driving Tour. Um, it's about it's a self-guided tour. So what you'll do is you'll come into Poozy and I'll hand you a brochure that I've written up and it'll have we'll have numbered stops marked along about seven miles worth of trail that you can drive on. And so at each of these numbered stops, um, you'll read about in the brochure what's going on at that stop. So I might be talking about um, some management that we're working on there or something about the area. We, there's a lot of history on the area. So I might mention something about some historical significance of an area, kind of like Panthers did. Um, and then we have a stop in the middle where you can get out and we'll have a bunch of um, tables and exhibits and stuff where people can, you can talk to some MDC. We've got our private land conservationists might be there. Um, I kind of don't have everything nailed down for this year yet, but hopefully we'll have Quell Forever there as well. They, you can talk to them about native plants and um, working for your quail and upland game birds. Um, and kind of whatever, we've got um, some historical photos of Poozy too. So it's kind of a chance to get out, stretch your legs, talk to some people, and then you can continue on the rest of the tour. That's awesome. I just saw Karen uh, commented in the Q&A and said they went last year, seven miles of fun, and you can pull off to look anywhere. That sounds like a blast. Um, and let me just ask, um, so uh, Poozy is a little shy of 6,000 acres. That is a lot of space, right? Is there anything that uh, we can do as a community to help support Poozy? Do you ever have groups come up there and volunteer? Any opportunities like that you want to share? Um, I haven't had anything yet. I was kind of thinking about doing, we've had um, some problems with some bush honeysuckle lately. Um, kind of, that's one of the things that I actually highlight on the tour this year is that it was a lot of Poozies kind of patchworked from old homesteads and stuff. And there was a house and they planted bush honeysuckle as a um, ornamental in front of their house and now it's everywhere around Pikes Lake so I was thinking about probably trying to do a volunteer day to just go out and pull honeysuckle um, so we might work on that for the spring I think yeah I was gonna say fall's a great time for that too so any of you master naturalists in St. Joe head on up to Chillicothe and give a Sam a hand right <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Dylan and Sam, for joining us today. Um, I just have a couple announcements before we go. So I'm going to go ahead and take over the screen. Okay. So thank you everyone for your insightful questions and a big thanks again to Sam and Dylan for your assistance today um, and for making learning so much fun. I had a blast hiking with y'all in person and also enjoyed learning more from y'all today about Poozy and these different land management methods. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you viewers for joining us for Native Plants at Noon today with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, but before you go, I do have a couple exciting announcements. Um, we are hiring, Deep Roots is hiring a program manager and we're seeking an additional team member to oversee our summer garden tour series, Planet Native Conference and more. This position is a program manager. So if you have any questions about that position, um, you can go to Deep Roots website um, and see that there. Oh, I realize I have my wrong slides on. You know how it goes. Let's try that one more time. Um, here we go. And apologies. There we go. Okay. So visit deeproots.org to learn more about our new position as we're seeking another program manager to expand our awesome team. I have so much fun working here and you can too. So if you have uh, missed any of our recordings, you can find them all at deeproots.org. We record and post each one. And while you're on your site, we would be grateful if you consider making a donation to keep Deep Roots going and help offset the cost of producing educational content. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you back here next month. Thank you.